All right, good afternoon. Everyone, thanks for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you. As you can see, I hope it's clear on the screen. We're having a look at something which sounds very big and intimidating, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, but I promise by the end of this, this is actually gonna become uh, one of your best friends. It's a really amazing piece of mathematics. Now, if you have a look at something like the fundamental theorem of calculus and you like go and look it up online, like if you go to that, uh, faithful friend of every person who's tried to do an assignment last minute and uh, head on to Wikipedia. Um, the fundamental theorem of calculus page on Wikipedia um, is very full. There's a lot happening. Um, when you start to read the top of it, it's not too bad. I mean, for example, but basing off, um, you know, Mrs. Lee's lesson that she gave us before, there is a fair bit of history here. And you might look at that first sentence and think, oh, the fundamental theorem of calculus relates differentiation and integration. I know what both of those are. So far, so good, but things rapidly go south. If you have a look even just a little bit down the page and you have a look at some of this awful notation here, some of which you recognize, but others of which you're like, I have no idea what's happening. Um, it is just like generally confusing and it, you can understand why that is because the fundamental theorem of calculus, as the name suggests, is something which lays at the foundation of so much of what we do in mathematics. A lot of the things that we've been talking about in the news, actually, just people haven't been using all of the specific language for it. And so rather than give you kind of, you know, notation soup and make you very confused, I want to actually use the news as our starting point for, you know, why does this piece of mathematics matter for us and how can it actually help us understand the world and solve problems? So to that end, I've got a little graph for all of you to have a look at. Now I should stress, um, all of this is made up numbers. I mean, they're not completely made up. Uh, those numbers on the left-hand side of the graph, um, the last thing I checked, I think it was something like 5,800. And those days since the first confirmed case in Australia, I think the first confirmed case was around late January. So, you know, we're in early April now. We're around day 67, 68. So apart from them being vaguely in the right ballpark, everything else about this is made up. Uh, that graph is made up. It doesn't look that nice and simple in reality, um, but I'm kind of hoping that we're heading toward this spot where, um, you know, the curve is starting to slow down and it doesn't look like a crazy exponential thing that's out of control. Now, I want to use this kind of made up set of data to try and understand uh, this fundamental theorem of calculus. Use it as an example, use it as a, as a context for which to make sense of this. And I kind of want to guide us through this by having to think about um, a very simple and foundational question, as the name kind of suggests. And that is, what's the total number of new cases um, on the basis of this graph, which we'll interpret together, between now, which I'm just going to call day 67, and some future time, like say day 71, that's visible on my graph. What's the total number of new cases in that limited period of time? Let's have a look at this graph, and it isn't all that dissimilar to the kinds of graphs you actually have been seeing uh, thrown around the news. How would we answer that question about the total number of new cases? How would we answer that on the basis of this graph? Well, it's not meant to be a rhetorical question. I'm sort of trying to stall a little bit and buy time for you if you're drawing a rough copy of this graph in your own workbook. Have a think about this. I'm trying to compare day 67 with day 71, and you can see both of those on the horizontal, I guess we'd call it the time axis down the bottom. How would we use this graph to get an answer to that question? Okay, so while you're drawing, let me try and fill in a little bit, right? Um, the difference from day 67 to day 71, it's had an increase, obviously. So we can work out, well, where did we start and how far did we rise? Okay, where did we start? How far did we rise? So to work out where we started, I'm gonna to go to day 67 on the horizontal axis. I'm gonna draw it up, whoops, not with a highlighter. I'm gonna draw it up toward the graph and see where it collides. There's my point of intersection. And I've given you nice, neat numbers here. It's part of why they're so artificially simple, just so that we don't get confused by the arithmetic. And it maps over to 6,000. So let's just suppose that there's 6,000 total cases of the coronavirus in Australia on day 67. And then we just have to look forward in time to what this projected model tells us. On day 71, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. I'm going up from the bottom here. You can see I'm going to collide on the graph at this point over here. And again, reading over to the left to our vertical axis, it tells me, all right, 
I apparently am expecting I should have 11,000 cases by that time. So the numbers here are not immensely complicated. What's the total number of new cases? The answer would be, uh, let's see here, I'll just write it in the middle of the graph so you can see it. The total number of cases would be 11,000. Take away the 6,000 that we already had at day 67. So not complicated numbers. 5,000 is the answer we come up with. Now, you might think, well, this is a very rudimentary question. It's pretty basic. What is there to gain? Like, what does this have to do with calculus? Well, in mathematics, all the way through, like we've been teaching you algebra, trigonometry, differentiation, all the rest, um, one of the primary mechanisms we use to understand something better is to look at the same object from different perspectives. When you look at the same object from different perspectives, you always gain insight. You see it from a different side and you think, oh, there are things I didn't notice about this before. So what I want to do is look at this same perspective and I'd love you to draw a graph underneath this, underneath this sort of Cartesian plane looking thing, which uh, looks very similar. It's going to have the same days across the bottom. It will have a similar kind of vertical axis as well. And what I want to think about is what we know from differential calculus. Everything we know in integral calculus for a long way has been built on what we learned from derivatives and differentiation. So what I'd love you to do is draw a new graph of this um, without the same blue plot on it. And in this case, we're actually going to draw the derivative. So to fill in the gaps, this is kind of what I am talking about. This is the same set of axes. You can see I've got days since the first confirmed case and the same timeline that I had before. But now I want to think about, well, how is this situation changing over time? Not what is the total, um, but what are the, what are the new cases day by day? So I'm looking for a rate of change. Um, I guess we would call this left hand, uh, this vertical axis, I should say, I guess we would call it something like um, the projected new cases per day. The projected number of cases that come up each day, not a cumulative total, but you know, how many did we count up this day that we, we didn't know had coronavirus before? So let me just write that in for you. Um, this is the projected number of new cases. Now, one of the reasons why I gave you such, like I said, uh, an artificially simple graph from before is so that we can just read off of that graph what numbers should go onto here. So I'm actually going to go back up to that graph and let's have a look at it together. Um, if you have a look, there's clearly two different parts to the graph. There's the earlier situation, which is quite steep. And then thankfully in this projected model, it starts to level off and become a bit shallower. So I'm going to look at each one of those in turn. Firstly, let's have a look at the first part from um, day 67, in fact, even a little bit before day 67, and then it sort of stops at day 68. That's where there's kind of this bend in the graph. Have a look carefully, and I'm gonna zoom in just so you can see it as clearly as possible. Have a look clearly and tell me if you can see what is the gradient of this straight line in this portion of the graph. When you change one day, how much do you increase in the number of cases? Anyone I'm going to go ahead and type it in the chat? I can see all of the comments coming up. Can anyone tell me what the gradient of that first portion of the line should be? Uh, okay, I'm seeing a few numbers in here. <laughs> okay, a lot of numbers. Kevin, I get it, thank you. Um, I'm interested, look, look closely, look at the units, guys. Have a look at the vertical axis and how it goes up each time. Okay, yes, thank you, Lawrence. All right, so what is gradient? Gradient is rise over run. So if we have a look at the rise for one unit, right? If I'm running one unit from left to right, what's the rise that corresponds to that? Well, when you go from day 67 to day 68, as Lawrence and Jason have identified, it rises from 6,000 to 8,000 cases. So that's a gradient of 2,000, or 2,000 over one, I guess is the most technical way to say it. Um, before day 67, you've got a teeny bit of graph there, but you can see it's a straight line, it's continuous, okay? So if I zoom back out now, let's go to our new graph where we're gonna show the derivative. And what we want is for this early portion, from just before day 67 through day 67 and into day 68, we want to show that that has a gradient of 2000. So let's have a look here. 